we find ourselves in the Eastern Kingdom, deep in the southwestern parts of the continent. The group of adventurers we're following had been traveling for many days, their journey bringing them to the humid marshlands of the Swamp of Sorrows. Under the lush green canopies of the twisting trees, a campfire was lit, offering a calm warmth in these unforgiving lands. Their group consisted of a young orc, a fearless jungle troll, a battle-hardened night elf, and a stalwart human. The four were worn and exhausted from their long travel. With weary bodies, they tried to regain their strength. I do not like these swamps. How can anything survive in these parts? I prefer the open plains of Duratar. At least I can see what I'm fighting there. You be worrying too much, Olga. I was born in these type of marshes. Once you know one of them, you know all of them. And I'll be telling you, we be fine. Janeiro is right. The Swamp of Sorrows are treacherous, yes. But if we do not separate, your worries will be unfounded. Ha! Your words are belittling. But I suppose you are right. Not that it makes me lower my guard any less. You're too much of a wuss, Olga. And you're supposed to be a great orc warrior? Hardly believable. Watch your tongue, human. I've had enough of your petty little remarks. Face me in a duel and prove that there is a man behind those words. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm sorry, your warriorness. I concede. Let me tell all of you a story instead, to lighten up the mood, if you will. Now lean in close and listen to the tale of the dreadful Dulahan. During times long gone, there was a merchant returning from the Guardian's Tower of Karazhan, haunted by the drowning void of night. He made haste to return back to town and harmed, with his wares tightly secured in a bag in his left hand. All the courage he could muster was barely enough to get him through the woods. Minutes before safety, his ears collected the faint voice of a crying child. Valiant in nature, he could not forsake this lost and frightened lamb. He followed the wailing past the watchtower east of what is now Darkshire, until he found himself in a clearing with a small silhouette cowering before a grave. An eerie scenery, but its pluck did not wane. If he could bring this frightened child to safety, then the light would surely grace him with good fortune. But the light was not present at such a place. The merchant reached out only to realize the figure was not what he expected it to be. Instead, a violent grimace carved into someone's face greeted him. A horrified scream was the last thing he uttered before the glinting steel of a sword silenced him forever. Heavy rain poured over the town's morning as the guards were doing their usual rounds. Despite the thunderstorm, it had been an uneventful dawn. Yet what was to come would cement itself into the soon-to-be Darkshire folklore. What they witnessed was a horrifying scene. The headless merchant trotted through the entrance gate before slumping over the town streets. Bewildered and petrified alike, they raced the lanterns high into the air, noticing an ominous figure at the top of a street leading eastward. Far off in the distance, behind the merchant's lifeless body, illuminated by occasional lightning, Another headless man, clad in armor, holding the merchant's own head like a lantern. Maniacal cackling echoed through the forest, and he vanished within the blink of an eye. To this day, the guards find headless corpses strewn about the forest, accompanied by the bone-chilling laughter of an urban legend. With the narration complete, Richard's face lingered in the warming light of the campfire, twisting his features into a grim visage. The night has advanced, and the countless stars of the great beyond littered the sky. Gennaro and Venuris were visibly entertained by Richard's competent narrative prowess, yet their orcish companion was a bit too enamored by his legend. Oh my, Richard. What an interesting story you have shared with us. Although, I reckon it would have been more effective had we heard it before traveling through Dustwood. Thank you, Ovenioris. This legend is told to any child of Stormwind and its lands to make them not wander off from home. 
Doesn't always help, mind you. I certainly couldn't be intimidated by such a silly mare. <laughs> but I guess our princess over here had a good fright. <laughs> Sh shut your mouth. This is not true. I was simply captivated by your talent as a storyteller. But don't get the wrong idea, Richard. You still owe me an honorable duel for your pathetic words earlier. While I be enjoying seeing you two duel, we should wait until the day breaks. You never know what be waiting in the ticket. Not you as well, Gennaro. I told you. Shush, everyone. We're not alone. Finally, I was getting bored. The four companions rallied their weapons and spells, ready to take on any foe who dared cross their way. The slushing, wet noises coming out of the woodwork grew louder with each step their adversary made. It did not take long before Veneris was able to catch a glimpse of what lurked between the foliage. A pair of piercing red eyes darted straight in her direction. Watch out, everyone! The unknown beast lunged its massive arm in their direction. While the night elf was able to dodge, the safety of their campfire was extinguished by the mass of the hulking monster, leaving them at the mercy of the star's shine. Oh, this just be wonderful. Vinegar, get us some Latin here. You don't have to ask me twice. Mother Moon, grant us your guiding light. Venerys grabbed her staff tightly and raised it high above her head. Crackling energy resonated from the crystal adorning the staff, before blinding white light illuminated the darkness. The beast before them could now be seen clear as day. An overgrowth of vines, roots, and plants dragged itself over the swampy earth. Terrifying red eyes and a gritted mouth jutted out of the tangled mess of a body. They had seen creatures like these before, in the wetlands. But something about this subject was off. Stay cautious, everyone. This is no ordinary foe. I am sorry, my dear, but for once I have to disagree. I am dying to let out some frustration. Let me at it. Richard, wait. All attempts to stop the overzealous rogue fell on deaf ears. Grabbing his two daggers, Richard lunged at the heavy creature, sinking them deep into its mossy flesh. Twisting and turning the knives, the beast let out a horrible scream. Believing himself victorious, Richard continued his assault, driving the dagger down on its arm, aiding him with a precise shots from Gennaro's bow. You are pretty too wild, my human friend. Don't hug out the glory alone, huh? Don't you worry, I would never... What? Still clinging to the bog beast, Richard was caught off guard by something he'd never seen before. Out of the bundle of vines he had just cut scrawled a scrawny and cadaverous being thrashing at the rogue. Its blackened claws and stick-like finger grabbed him by the arm with an unexpected force. Richard pulled his other knife out of the pile of sentient vines and attempted to stab whatever got hold of it. But it was too late, as the horror already lunged forward, sinking a grotesque row of razor-sharp teeth into his right arm, followed by his painful scream. Get your rotten hands off my friend! A battle cry echoed through the night and the young orc tightened the grip around her outrider axes. Sprinting towards the beast, she dodged the heavy blow from his right appendage before severing its left arm with a devastating arc upwards. The intimidating beast and its mysterious inhabitant let out a blood-curdling scream while its severed extremity hit the ground with a wet and mighty thud. Richard fell to the ground, clearly in pain and pressing down on the wound. The nurse hurried to his aid, dragging him away and tending to the bite with a quick healing spell. Good to have you here. Been long since I've been in your arms. Oh, shut it. Now it's not the time for your antics. This wound requires immediate attention. Ogre, done it all. Give that light forsaken thing a good whack from me as well. While Venerus was occupied with caring for her friend's wounds, Ogre and Gennaro put their attention to the emaciated being that emerged from the vine monster. 
Long, stick-like limbs, a thin body, and pale skin made it reminiscent of a ghoul, yet its speed suggested it to be still well alive. The quick and rapid movements made it difficult for the two assailants to keep up. This hellspawn just won't stop moving! Oh, bad food will be coming from this enemy. We better finish him quickly. Strike after strike, arrow after arrow, but none of them hit their target. The skittering monstrosity was simply too elusive for them. While the Orc Control did their best to secure a swift takedown, they could not deliver a definitive blow. Not long after, it crawled back into the heaving mound of moss and vine, giving it new life. Staring in disbelief, the four of them saw the bog beast rise up once more, letting out an invigorated roar. Raising its thick arms high above its head, it prepared another grounding slam when... A magic missile landed onto its side, blasting a huge chunk of mossy flesh from its body, making it fall off. Trying to ascertain the magic's origin, the four of them looked around the dimly lit night, before hearing an old raspy voice coming from the thicket. Quickly, over here! The beast will not falter for long. If you wish for your friend to survive, follow me. Perplexed by the sudden appearance of their rescuer, the group of adventurers were hesitant at first. Who was this enigmatic figure extending his helping hand to them? As the plant-covered beast began to move, their time to think was cut short. On a quick notice of Gennaro, they started their escape, following the enigmatic savior into the swamp. Venerus was leaning over Richard's sweating and feverish body. Her healing magic might have closed the wound on his right arm, yet a sickening, dark coloration remained on his flesh. Cooling his head with a wet piece of cloth, she turned with a disappointed gaze to her compatriots who were sitting around the fire with equally muddied expressions. His fever will not wane. It is as if a fire burns deep inside him. As much as I'm praying to Walloon, her guiding light cannot quell this sickness. I am Mojo be coursing through his body. My tribe knows her hexes and curses on enemies, but this is beyond all I've ever seen. That is because this friction is not from this world. The medium-sized humanoid stepped closer to the fireplace, with his hands behind his back and a dignified look upon his face. There were others like him at the center of the village, if one could even call it that, whispering hushed words while staring at Olgra, whose stern look pierced the night. How about you be telling us where we are and who you are? I suppose this would be adequate, yes. You find yourself in the harborage, our humble sanctuary, in which we fight for our daily survival. My name is Karal of the... Of the Draenei. Exile people of the world of Draenor, home to the Orcish people as well. My father told me about your race when I was younger. That is correct. Our people share a bloody past, one we cannot easily forget, and some never forgive you for. It was inevitable that there would be whispers about you, young one. However, the Nether tells of your people's curse and victory over our common enemy, the Burning Legion. So I see that there are amends taken for your past misdeeds. Either way, I apologize for the discomfort their staring brings you. It's fine. Don't break your head over it. An orc warrior is steadfast enough to not have mere looks bring them out of focus. And besides, you saved our hides. I have no reason to have qualms against you. <laughs> I suppose so. Karl, what was that beast attacking us in the swamp? The way you spoke about it tells me you know more about its nature. 
The aged Drenai took a seat near the fireplace. Flickering flames danced around his wrinkled features, illuminating his face in a somber light. Silent contemplation fills the air as the sage collects his thoughts. With a look of resolve, he turned to the others and began to speak anew. When our people fled the dying world of Draenor, we did so using the ancient rites of Riftwalking, opening portals to any world that could act as a sanctuary for us. Ak Zador and Kula were the ones leading us to our new home, which incidentally ended up being the same world the orcs had been banished to as well. After entering the swamp, the remaining rift magic coalesced and materialized itself into Dranthist crystal, sacred germs natural to Draenor. While we brought many of our own through the rift walk, these ones crystallized on their own, granting themselves into the unknown world. The Dranthist crystals harbor otherworldly power and are as such revered by us both for their magical and sentimental properties. Some take this reverence too far, however. Den Bor was a young apprentice of our Riftwalkers. Like with many before, his admiration for Dranthist reached heights many of us were worried about. Enamored by its energies, it reached to a point in which he stole one of our most powerful crystals, the Shard of Akasha which he fled the harborage with. We pursued him into the swamp, confronting him about his foolishness in hopes he would come to his senses. He refused, which ultimately sealed his demise. An enraged bog beast with unforeseen strength rampaged through the thicket, overwhelming us and grabbing Den Boor in the process. We tried to save him. But before we could act, the Dranathish art already acted on its own. Warped by the wild magics, Den Boor and the monstrosity merged into one being, creating a grotesque abomination that haunts the swamp ever since. We call it the Maya Beast. Silence laid upon the fireplace. Contemplating the story just told, the adventurers were deep in thought with Richard's breathing growing more uneven. Corral's gaze was focused on the fire in front of him, finding calm within the flames. Neither of them could muster a word. Were they not worried sick about their friend and the ailing illness coursing through his body? But one of them would not be quelled by melancholy fever. Draenei, what do we need to do to save his life? We do not have much time left. I have told you before, the sickness is not of this world. Therefore, any cure coming from your world would only prolong his suffering. Many of our tribesmen succumb to the same fate, and we were unable to conjure a definite healing for it. However, given the symptoms shown in the victims... Karal hesitated. A grave look to Richard, then to his compatriots. Their expressions filled with determination. A sigh escaped the old one before continuing his speech. Many of us tried to slay the Meyer Beast in hopes of rescuing those afflicted by its horrible curse. I have set up a theory in which I believe the key to their survival is to be the Shard of Akasha, nestled deep within the abnormality that roams the swamp. I cannot guarantee it will succeed. This beast you be finding us first once already. How can we be turning the tides by finding it instead? We notice that it seems to be attracted to fire, or rather the scent emitted by the firewood. It assaulted many travelers resting in the swamp, so we assume a specific branch is the cause for its aggression. Most likely, it is the bald beast nature of it that seeks those burning plants in an attempt to extinguish them. Those plants we burned must be the same you'll be talking about. If only we'd be knowing that before. Then let's not waste any more time. Our friend is on death's bed and I will not have him suffer such a dishonorable demise. Draenei, would you aid us in battle and release our friend from this nightmare? 
You have courage, young one. But courage is the fool's closest friend. You have faced the Mire Beast before. Are you certain you wish to face it once more? Ogre's determined expression and steadfast posture held more meaning than any word she could have said. Relieved at her unwavering resolve, Karel agreed. Very well then. I see there is little to gain in persuading you to reconsider. Preparation is key to our survival. I advise you to think of everything that might turn the battle to our favor. His words still heavy in their mind, but an eye returned to his tribesmen, leaving the adventurers to their own vices. Locked in silent contemplation, Richard's battle against the sickness was all they could think of. If there is a way, just a sliver of chance of undoing this curse, they would take it, no matter what. We will make quick work of it, Veneris. What counts is that you give us enough time to secure the conquest over this Mire Beast by staying with Robert for the time being. Rest assured, I will keep watch over him. Mother Moon will give me the strength to mend his pain until you return. Stay focused on the beast you were meant to vanquish. Don't lose hope. I am certain you can win this battle. You be counting on us, friend. This trainer seems powerful and wise. His power over magic will be helpful in subduing the beast. And I trust in Ulgra to lead us to glorious victory. Invigorated by their strength and support, the Orc Control readied their weapons and rations before convening with their deny guide once more. With the night soon ending, the three made their way back into the foggy thicket of the dangerous Swamp of Sorrows. Heavy smoke arose from the burning vines, trailing off into the canopy clearing above. The three of them were hiding behind the trees, waiting for their prey to sense the charred plants to extinguish them once more. Although the wait had been long and painful, their will did not waver. Can we be certain that it can be lured again? This beast appears to be more intelligent than one would give it credit for. We used to burn these vines at the harbor edge because of the vibrancy of their fire, and were attacked night after night. After discovering they had been the source of the Mire Beast's agitated state, he had not attacked us directly ever since. Ah, I guess that makes sense. Still, it did not take that long when we lit our fireplace earlier. I am getting anxious simply sitting around. Patience, young one. Calm your heart and follow what we discussed. The nightmare will end today, regardless of what may come. Stay sharp. There be rustling in the dark. Just across the fallen tree over there. Drawing his bow, Gennaro walked into the direction he had heard the noise originate from. He trusted his senses, just as much as he trusted his allies' strength and wit needed to end the Mire Beasts. Deep, hammering thuds echoed from within the darkness, foreboding the horror they are about to face. Remaining hidden behind in the undergrowth, Karel and the troll sought their assigned position, for a brave ogre stepped out, facing the beast directly. With twin axes in hand, she assumed a powerful pose, radiating pride and dominance. With its armory grown, scars and torn tissue were strewn about the Maya Beast's body, clear signs it had not fully recovered from its last skirmish. Enraged at seeing its floral brethren burned, it let loose a mighty roar of anguish, flailing wildly around itself, damaging nearby trees. Ogre tightened the grip around her axes, preparing herself for battle. Come at me with everything you have, foul beast. I'll show you an orc's true strength. Loktar Ogar! With those words, the Mire Beast commenced its attack. Wild sweeps and slams all around it ravaged the area, extinguishing the lit fire, leaving only the rising dawn to offer sight. The orc retaliated with swift strikes herself, creating deep cuts in the outer layer of the mossy skin. While she was able to evade its rabid attacks, her footing was not optimal on the muddy swamp ground. She could not keep this up for too long, else her fatigue would catch up with her. 
The Maya beast took another swing, smashing his heavy appendages into the dirt. This was the moment she had waited for. With a quick but tumbling sprint, she rushed to the extended arm and made it just in time for a powerful cross-cut, severing most of its vines. The creature roared a painful scream. Agitated by the hurt, it lunged at Olga and grabbed her with incredible speed. The vines wrapped themselves around her body, squeezing and crushing her under the immense pressure. Under groans of pain, she tried to loosen its grip, but not being able to use her arms and axes, she was left to its mercy. Another violent scream by the beast, followed by the same phenomenon that her friend Richard experienced. The mossy body parted itself, and the pale, emaciated figure from the floor emerged, dead boar. The skeletal dry crawled out of the hole in his host's chest, hissing and gurgling at the orc. Black sludge dripping from his jaw. His eyes were dried up in their sockets, leaving harrowing holes behind. Meanwhile, Ogre kept on struggling to break the Maya Beast's hold. Looking straight ahead, she peered into the agape chest of it, noticing a faint glimmer inside. That must be it. The source for all of this, the Shard of Akasha. This was the moment they waited for. The only chance they had. Corral! No! Oh! The Drenai who had hidden out of the beast's sight emerged from behind a tree, still channeling a crackling and powerful arcane spell. Aiming it directly at the insides of the towering bog beast, he was about to unleash it. Den Moore, alarmed by his former mentor's intention, commanded his host to attack him instead, dropping Olgra into the dirt below. With a quick motion, the massive appendage crashed in Karal's direction. But just before it could hit him, the buzzing of a short arrow stopped the Mire Beast in its tracks. A shadowy blast erupted from the ground, and ghostly chains and whips restrained the beast's motion. The orc looked to her right as she immediately recognized what had happened. A shadow binding arrow shot by Dinero fettered Den Boar, making him unable to control the monster any longer. Letting out a high-pitched screech, the malformed Renai screamed at Karal before he let loose his channeled spell. The arcane bolt launched into the immobile beast, causing a violent eruption, blowing it into a million pieces. A shockwave blasted from the impact, sending both Den Boar and Olgra against a tree. Gennaro quickly rushed to her. Olgra! You'll be alright. The orc nodded while she regained her footing. Observing the battlefield, a great crater formed where the Maya beast had been destroyed. In its center lay the Shard of Akasha, untouched, as if it had never been near the explosion. Opposite of it, Den Boar, heaving and pulling himself on the muddy ground toward his beloved crystal, gurgling and weeping, his fragile body could barely move. Karal, both disgusted and distressed at the sight, watched him struggle with a solemn look on his face. His apprentice raised his head towards him under much pain, while wailing under his remaining breath. A few convulsions followed, before life finally escaped his broken body. Whoa. It'd be over, ain't it? Then the whore died long ago. Whatever was left operating the bog beast was nurtured by the shard, acting as its beating heart. Now that the connection has been severed, life quickly drained from him. An ample reminder of the volatile nature of magic travelers. Sizzling energy emanated from the burnt ground as Karal picked up the mighty Dranathist crystal. The air was still heavy from the impact. Stowing the shard in his bag, he turned to Gennaro and Ogre. Come, let us rescue your friend. Glowing vibrantly, the shard hummed with a soothing vibration. Karal was reciting words in an unknown language that none of them understood. Venerus assisted the Janai with a healing spell on her own, stabilizing Richard's already weak condition. The black markings that ventured all across his right arm began to sear, emitting an equally black smoke. Screaming in pain, Richard began to squirm and breathe heavily. 
Regardless, Karal continued his incantation until all of it burned away, leaving him with just a flesh wound from the bite. Relieved to see the sickness gone, his companions let out deep sighs. Richard's breathing stabilized before he went back to rest. May Mother Moon's blessing be upon you, my friend. Without you, we would have lost a dear friend today. Shahalorma. I should be the one thanking all of you. Had it not been for your courage, we would have never been able to cure all the sick cursed by the Maya Beast. Your actions today ensured the survival of my people, and for that, you have my eternal gratitude. Venurus, was it? Could you assist me in curing my tribesmen? It would be an honor. Joining the Draenei deeper into the harborage, Gennaro and Augra stayed with Richard, securing his well-being. While the troll was visibly relieved, he noticed that his orc friend still had worries on her mind. What you be thinking about, Ogra? Still doubts troubling your mind? When my father told me stories about the Draenei, I never thought I would fight with one in battle, let alone meet so many of them. To be honest with you, I am fine with them avoiding me. For them, I must be the savage that they still remember. Funnily enough, they are exactly how I imagined they. And how be that, good Strong-willed, humble, and dignified. With that said, a slight smile conjured on her face. Taking a deep breath, she laid her gaze upon the scenery in front of her. Richard's peaceful slumber continued, while Veneris assisted Caral in his healing. Gennaro kept maintenance on his bow. Looking at the campfire, she followed the trail of smoke, rising into the sky, breaking a new dawn. <laughs>